Good morning, good afternoon to everyone and welcome to our cloud coaching event. Today we will show you how to implement a RAC chatbot using vector similarity search and generative AI LLMs. My name is Violeta, I'll be one of the hosts for, uh, for this session. Important note regarding the demo, so all the examples that we uh, present in the following um, uh, session are purely fictive, of course, and they are not showcasing uh, reality. They were built only for um, um, uh, demo purposes only. Um, one more note regarding the, the scope of the call. So we are all here to, to learn. And in case you want to use our services further, feel free to connect with somebody from the Oracle account team. Also, if you watch any of our sessions recordings in the future, bear in mind that there might be some differences in the Cloud Console menu because our products are enhanced uh, on a regular basis. I think that was all on my side. Bogdan, Liana, are you ready? Thank you. Thank you, Violeta. We're, uh, we're so ready. <laughs> yes. Uh, so let me share my screen. Just a second to find the right window. Okay, I think here we are. Uh, Violeta, everything okay? Are you seeing it? Perfect. So, quick introduction. I'm uh, Bogdan and together with Liana here, we're part of a very, very interesting team called the, well, the Digital Adoption Team. And our main task is to interact with Oracle Cloud clients in a programmatic way because we have so many of them and we need to be able to address their concerns without talking in person with uh, each of them. So obviously one of the new ways to do that is chatbots, LLM chatbots because they, uh, they, well, they move forward the needle so much about, uh, about uh, these kinds of interactions. Liana, if you want to say a few words, this is the moment. Thank you. Thank you, Bogdan. Hello, everyone, and welcome. I'm glad you were able to join us today. My name is Liana. Um, I'm uh, focused on application development within this team, and perhaps some of you uh, who might have jo uh, joined uh, the kickoff sessions before uh, might know me from the uh, security session. Um, thank you uh, for joining us today once again, and I hope you find the information uh, useful. Thank you. Thank you, Liana. So let's uh, let's move forward then and start with uh, our workshop. What uh, we will discuss today is how to build uh, a chatbot and more specifically a chatbot with uh, um, a technique called RAG, Retrieval Augmented Generation. And we will use vector similarity search and our own Oracle Generative AI's uh, LLMs to do that. Well, if you don't know what that means, you will find it out today, so all good. Uh, first, uh, building a, a chatbot is, a, a production chatbot is a complicated endeavor because every production system is, uh, well, complicated, right? And there are a lot of things to be taken into consideration. So we will not discuss about everything today, but just we will focus just on how to parse a data source, put it in a vector database, retrieve that information from the vector database, and then send it to the uh, large language model to craft a response. That's the scope for today. Uh, at the end, we will discuss what other things are needed in order to actually uh, have a working chatbot. But before that, let's uh, take a look take, take a look at the high level architecture of such a system. So maybe you're used already by the old paradigm paradigm like uh, three tire uh, architecture. We have a new one now, which is well data, model, and service. And let's discuss them a little bit because this is important for the sanity of each uh, and any LLM-based, chatbot-based application from now on. And we start with, as usual, with data because the, the data availability, the data formats, the 
what's there in the data sources it's uh, as usual paramount for uh, how we build our application uh, so in the data layer we have documents we have data warehouse we have plain old sql databases or data lakes we have everything that's needed for our chatbot to reason right we need what we need uh, the, the chatbot to be able to respond about it's obviously there then the next layer is uh, the the new thing it's the model layer where we have the language models the ai part uh, here we host any data modifications that are done using data science or uh, fine tuning of the of the models everything that's needed to convert the data from the from the coming from the data layer and then reason uh, on base, based on it and uh, came with a response or with something that's uh, relevant for our users and then finally the last uh, uh, the last layer is the service layer so everything that's done by the model should be exposed to the the world right to the users and here we have the the interface the apis uh, that are needed for the for the ui to interact with the with the application and obviously also the well the networking part the 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 security part so all that uh, ui kind of uh, uh, of uh, of layer right so that's uh, about the high level architecture so what we will do next is to well to set up everything and then we will have an faq text based file we will split it into chunks and store the chunks as vectors in a, in a vector database, Oracle Database 23AI in our case. And then we will uh, configure the, the OCI Gen AI service, uh, service. And uh, then the most in interesting part, we will uh, get a user question, retrieve the chunks that are relevant to that question from the vector database, and then pass it, uh, pass them to the to the LLM to create a, a response. We will not see the live code now, but we will go through through the through the live lab and we will see what's uh, what's going on. Of course, after the after our our webinar, you are more than free to go to the live lab and do it by uh, by yourself. So now let's move to the next part, which is setting up the vector database. And Liana, please, if you want to take over. Yeah, thank you very much, Bogdan. So um, first of all, uh, before we are able to do anything else, we will need to install our database. And the easiest way to get this exercise running once you will uh, do it for yourself um, is to um, start it up in a compute instance uh, that's running um, a Linux operating system. So using a virtual machine uh, within Oracle Cloud um, to install the database on top of it. Uh, this is because we are going to be using for this particular exercise the free version of Oracle Database 23 AI. This free version is available to you to um, test and play around with in case you just want to see how it works first um, and of course we also have 23 ai uh, available in autonomous database once you um, actually want to to go ahead with uh, with using it so once you have your um, compute instance ready for which um, there are installation guides within our um, workshop here uh, in case you are unfamiliar with that um, for us we are using the um, the oracle linux uh, image with uh, which is um, a red hat based image but of course you are free to use uh, any other operating system that supports uh, creating containers and running them um, and we will be needing at least 40 gigabytes of disk space and 8 gigabytes of RAM to, uh, to run our, our example. So for the Oracle Database 23 AI free version, there are many ways in which you can install it. For example, for like I mentioned, for Red Hat based systems, we have an RPM package that you can 
directly installed within your command line. Um, or uh, you can use the um, container image that is available um, on the Oracle Container Registry for free. You can just install that and use Podman or Docker to run it, which is what we are doing in this example. We are showing you how to install Podman in case you don't have it, um, and then how to run the database. So we do a Podman run uh, with a name that you give, um, give uh, the container which is to be started. The port, of course, as with uh, any default port for the Oracle database is 1521. Um, you can set up here a password for the database ad admin by using the Oracle underscore PWD um, environment variable. And um, of course, you need to give it a, a volume, which will be uh, which will be where the installation actually uh, resides and the link to the container registry. As you can see, it's container-registry.oracle.com dash database dash free uh, latest. So we are using the uh, the latest version, which if I'm not mistaken right now, it's 15.000. So this will set up your container and automatically start um, your database. Once we do that, we need to uh, perform some uh, configurations um, within the database itself to enable um, vectors uh, for it. So we can use it further in our example. So for this, the following command shows you how to um, start a bash uh, session, shell session uh, within our previously created container. And then once we are inside, we are going to use SQL plus to connect as sys, as the user sys uh, on the uh, database. And um, following that, we have a few um, SQL commands that we need to run. So let me tell you a bit about these uh, SQL commands. The first one, create big file table space, will obviously, as the name implies, create a table space, which is called TBS2. A big file table space will contain only a single data file, but that data file can be much larger than a traditional small file table space, which, as you can see, we are defining it to auto extend, right? The the default size is one gigabytes to, you know, um, give it a, a size uh, for, for testing for uh, some data that we will be using, but we can also extend that in case we need to in 32 megabits chunks, which is the, uh, the following line next 32 megabits max size unlimited, right? Uh, and we tell it to extend and uh, to do uh, automatic segment space management where Oracle will automatically handle the, the space allocation. So we're pretty much just creating the big file table space over here and telling it to increase it in small chunks when needed when we have uh, more data. Then we need to create the undo table space. Uh, I think it's a bit uh, up, Bogdan, the undo table space. Scroll a bit more, please. There we go. That's the one. The uh, undo table space uh, stores undo data, which is used to roll back transactions and to provide read consistencies. So again, just like the before table space, this one is initially one gigabits in size, gigabytes in size, sorry. Uh, and uh, we tell it where to store it, right? We give it a name for it. And we also enable auto extend for it. Next, we will create a temporary uh, table space, which is called temp demo. Um, this will be used for sorting and other temporary operations, right? The initial size again, one gigabyte, and reuse allows us to use the existing file if it exists already, right? So it doesn't um, create it uh, every time. Next, we will create our user, which is called vector, uh, identified by the password, uh, which is again a vector. <laughs> um, we tell it that the default table space will be TBS2, and we also grant it the database developer role. And then last but not least, we will create a P file, which is a parameter file from the server parameter file. So this uh, P file uh, or parameter fi file is a static text file. Um, and this command is used to create a readable version of our um, server parameter file. So what we will do is change um, the parameters and alter the system to set the vector memory size to 15, uh, 512 megabytes. Um, this change will take effect after the database is restarted. So the next commands show you how to shut down and start up the database and then check that the vector memory size has been um, automatically changed and set correctly to the new value. 
And once this is done, since we have our user and password, we can exit the SQL Plus session, we can then exit the Bash session, and our database is uh, ready to use uh, further for the setting up the, um, the Gen AI service and example. Thank you very much. Um, and Bogdan, over to you for, for the next part. Thank you, Thank you Liana. So let's um, quickly go to the next uh, step, which is installing the Python um, uh, environment. And there are many things to install here, and they are highly dependent on your platform and what you are doing on your, on your own uh, working uh, machine. But let me just point one thing here. We need some frameworks. And the first one is the well, Oracle DB uh, Python module, which is allowing us to connect to an Oracle DB database. Uh, we need sentence transformers for creating the vectors. We will see later on what how, how we do that. And then we, of course, need to have the OCI uh, Python module in order to uh, connect to the Gen AI uh, service. Uh, we will also need JupyterLab, but let's assume it's installed for this, uh, for this session. Now, let's jump to the, well, one of the, well, the first interesting step here which is about generating the vector embeddings and storing them in the database. But first, let's see why are we doing all this? Because you would say, and I'd say that initially, why not use an LLM uh, initial training in order to ask uh, it about, uh, about, well, our stuff, right? Because LLMs are, uh, big chunks of information and they should know about a lot of things, maybe also about our documentation too, especially if it's uh, publicly available. Well, there are many reasons why we don't do that. The first one is data relevancy because the, the, the LLMs, the, the models are trained uh, from time to time. They are not current on the information. They are trained with with big expenses <laughs> uh, at some point in time and they have a snapshot of the training data at that point so if your data even if it's the if it's included uh, in the in the initial training of the llm will be outdated quite uh, quite soon right so if you need current data you need to rely on something else right also, maybe your data, the, the one you want uh, the LLM to, to respond based on, maybe it's not public. Maybe it's something you have internal access to and you want to keep it that way. And um, uh, also there are many other considerations uh, to, to not use just the LLMs. Uh, for example, if the, if the LLM initial training is, well, having your data, but it's kind of not very important in its algorithm, then it will uh, hallucinate. It will try to make things up and you certainly don't want that if you, if you want clear answers based on factual data in your, in your data source uh, returned to your, uh, your users. So you need something else, right? And one approach we're, uh, we're demonstrating here is to just identify the relevant parts of our uh, data source based on the question from the client, <clears throat> and then insert that data in the prompt to the, to the LLM. Uh, we're going to say something like, uh, hey, LLM, this is uh, the data uh, you need to base your response on, and here is the question from the client, please make, uh, make a response based on, the, on this data and nothing else, right? But then we have another problem, because if we include our, all of our data in the prompt, then uh, the, the LLM will not be able to respond because prompts are limited in size. So each model has a maximum limit of the uh, prompt you're sending to it. 
And most likely, in many cases, most of the cases, I would say, the training, well, the, the, the data source, your data is bigger than the, the prompt. So you need something to uh, select just the data that is relevant to the, to the question. Again, there are here too many ways to do that. If you have a database with, with all your data, you, you could do just uh, old style uh, similarity uh, queries and that may work just fine. But there are newer methods to, to do a very relevant search because the, the questions from the, from the users could use other words than the ones you are using in your documentation. Instead of pet, they could say, I don't know, uh, familiar animal. And then the, the, the usual text-based uh, search algorithms are not returning what they should, right? So we're using vector search. And what's that? Uh, first, a vector is a, like a fingerprint of a text. Uh, but instead of just, I don't know, using the, the characters in the, in the text to create that fingerprints, uh, the, the vector encoding is using um, concepts. So if you have uh, cat and dog and, uh, I don't know, uh, lion, uh, they will be very similar to animal all of them and the first two of them so cat and dog will be very similar with pet but not lion and uh, i don't know rocket will be very different from a vector distance perspective to all of them so this kind of search is based on concepts right not just text similarity. So that's why we're, we're going to use, and in this RAG approach, you will see this vector search very much uh, used by mostly anyone. Of course, it's complicated, right? And you will need a lot of fine tuning and, and uh, maybe more complicated algorithms to retrieve your, your chunks of text that are uh, relevant to the question, especially if you have a very large database. Okay, that said, let's go forward and see uh, what, what we need here. So we will start with a FAQ source text, which is structured like this. We have a question, we have the answer to the question, and we have something to mark the the end of uh, of a pair and then we repeat that um, a lot right because the the, the faq text could have hundreds of uh, question responses pairs uh, so we make it available to our code and then we load it and this is our first uh, chunk of text we load it from the from a directory which could contain many FAQ files and uh, it will look something like uh, like this. So we have our FAQs variable with the source, the uh, in, in our case, a file called FAQ.txt. And then we have an array with all the, the chunks uh, that are, uh, are uh, needed. Okay. And then we uh, prepare the data because we need to message it a, a little bit and we want it to look something like this. So we have uh, the, the, let's say an object with a text uh, key containing our text and a path key containing our source because we might, might need that later in order to, for the response of the LLM to indicate the, the path, the, the source of the, of the data uh, it's, uh, it's using to, to create the, the answer. 
And then here at the beginning, you see the name of the source, uh, uh, a line, and then the text itself. We do that for a reason, because we want to preserve the context of the, of the chunk, right? Because here is not that relevant, but with a larger data source, you want each chunk of text to be to contain as many concepts from a vector perspective as possible <clears throat> because such a, a paragraph a chunk of text might not contain uh, relevant keys for the vector search to pick on it right so we try to preserve this this context in order to uh, make uh, to give a chance uh, to the vector search algorithm to pick on the right uh, on the right data sources uh, and chunks. Okay, so now we have the chunks in in a variable and we want to store them as vectors in a vector database. So first we create the connection to the to the Oracle 23AI database. It is easy. We have the username, the password, and the connection string. We import our uh, framework, and then we create a connection object. And that's it. <clears throat> We're connected from our code to the, to the database. Next step is to create a table to store the, the data. And this is easily done by this uh, SQL script we could create this by just running the SQL script against the database in a, in a SQL client. But here we, we demonstrate how to do that from your Python code. Pretty simple things here. We need an ID, a primary key. We need a column to store the vector data. And in 23A, we have the new data type which is called vector, right? And uh, we can work with, uh, with vector similarity and searches and all that. And then we have our payload, which is the original text and the data source and any additional metadata we want to store there. And it will be a JSON. And we store it in the database as <coughs> a JSON in order to be able to do SQL uh, searches and well statements ag uh, again uh, against the um, uh, content of the json if we want to do that next step is to vectorize the text chunks and put them in the database we will use a, <clears throat> a sentence transformer which is some sort of a mini model so what this mini model is doing is taking a string a a piece of text and create the vectors based on the concepts and uh, and all that I described before. There are many models to do that. We will use this one, uh, which is pretty good for general text and general usage. There are many, many more. Uh, most of them are freely available and they are tailored to very diverse use cases, for example, other languages than English or <clears throat> uh, transformers that are specialized on uh, medical uh, ling uh, language, right? But for our case and for many, many cases, this one is just fine. And then once we have our, uh, our sentence transformer uh, loaded, we create uh, a data structure that's uh, usable uh, by the sentence transformer. We need an ID, right, for our uh, primary key column. We need a vector source, which is the, the field that will be vectorized. And in our case, we just use the full text uh, of the chunk from the FAQ data file. And then we have the payload which is the, well, the metadata in the original text, as I said before. Uh, and then this is where the magic is happening. We create the embeddings by uh, encoding them with the encoder. 
and then we store the the vectors in the in the data structure we create before and then our next step is uh, the well the interesting one we're um, inserting the the well the data together with the vectors in the vector database and this is the all the magic is done here it's a very simple insert into our table with the id the payload and the vector and that's it at the end we commit the the transaction to the connection and everything will be stored in the in the database uh, now let's see if uh, everything uh, is fine and the data is uh, stored in the in the database so we do a simple select we execute the query, we fetch all the rows from the cursor, and then we print the well, each of the rows, in our case, the first five. And we will see something like this. So we have the uh, ID column, we have the meta information here with the, our text, our path, and then this ugly, uh, sorry, ugly looking uh, thing here it's the the vector so everything looks fine and it's stored in the in the database okay now we're ready with the ingestion part and this should be done once in a while every time your data source is uh, is changing so you need to do this ingestion offline let's say once in a while and then you will have all your data in the database. Now let's go to the next step, uh, which is in well, it's it's um, it's done every time a user is accessing the chatbot. It's uh, entering uh, the text of a question and is expecting an an answer. Uh, so the first step when we get the, the question is to create a vector out of it because we want to compare this vector of the of the question with the vector with the vectors stored in the in uh, in the database in our uh, in our table uh, so this will be done like this we will create a sql uh, string which will select our payload from the database and then the vector distance be uh, between the, the vector of the question and the vector of each of the rows using a cosine similarity uh, algorithm. There are many things to, to discuss here about this, but I don't think we have the, the, the time today. Uh, so it will select those two things from our table we will order by score i mean the costing distance between the vectors and we will fetch only the first i don't know 10 rows because we don't need all the database we just need the top hits uh, so this is the the sql we need but in order to call it we will need our uh, vector of the question so how we compute it we start with this question and then we create the embedding, the vector of the question with this simple line. We just use the encoder we defined in the previous step and we encode the question and that's it. And we prepare it a little bit uh, for, the, for the SQL query. And now we have all of that ready. Uh, we uh, execute the cursor uh, the the query with the with our cursor and we uh, load the responses as json in uh, in uh, in a text variable if we print the results we will get something like this so we have an array and we have a tuple of consisting of the vector distance the lower the better because the lower the distance the close the two vectors are the question and the chunk and then we have our meta information which is uh, 
uh, well, the text of the of the chunk here, sorry, until here, so the text of the chunk and the source, in our case, the path <coughs> to, <coughs> to the FAQ file. And well, that's it. This is the retrieval. It worked just like this, like this, very simple, nothing very complicated. And then we need to feed those chunks to the LLM prompt. And we need to create, to, to build that prompt based on the question, the, the chunks, and the, well, the instructions. But the first thing we need to do is to make sure that the chunks are not bigger than the model uh, uh, prompt uh, size because we don't want to get an error, right? So we need to truncate the string uh, uh, of the tokens, of, uh, sorry, of the, of the chunks to just keep it uh, uh, in, the, in the allocated size. And we use a tokenizer, in our case, Llama tokenizer fast. Uh, and we make sure that we have the only uh, the, the max tokens uh, number of, of tokens there and nothing more. In our case, we limit it to 1000 tokens, right? So we, we just truncate the string of the, coming from the, from, the, from the chunks and we obtain this, um, uh, this final string of text coming from your data source. So that's our knowledge base for this question. And then we create the prompt and there are many ways to do that again. But in our case, we use a system prompt that is uh, very simple. We name the assistant because in some cases you want or the customer will ask it about the name or, or you know, it's useful to do that. We instruct it to use only the sources that are here in the prompt and ignore the, the previous knowledge. And of course, this is just a suggestion for the LLM. Uh, in some cases, it will ignore what we said here, but it's, it, it should be here in order to steer it towards what we want. Also, we want to use markdown because in some cases in our data source, we have code and we want bullets and markdown is uh, very appropriate to, to, to represent that that way. And then we, because our clients are technical, uh, technical people, we need to, the LLM to respond in a technical manner, right? And then we have the, the basic instruction we have here the question, right? And we instruct the, the LLM to respond to this question by using only the information that is in the, in the knowledge, right? We, we include here. And here we, we mention the sources. So the, the knowledge base we want to use now and we include the, the documents we, we retrieved before. And finally, we want a very short answer, maximum three paragraphs, not many words per each paragraph, and very to the point and not rambling and not, uh, you know, being nice, just give the, the answer. Okay, and then the most interesting step. We need to use that prompt and the data and the question to call the LLM, the generative AI service. But first, in order to do that, uh, we need to do some, uh, some preparation. So we need a, a config file, right? That will authenticate us to the generative AI service. And we need some data, we need the, cast, the user and by user, we mean the, the developer of the application, OCID. We need a, 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 a OCI API key uh, with the fingerprint and the tenancy ID for the tenancy that's used for hosting the, the application. And we have here instruction 
on how to obtain all those. It's not very complicated. You get them from the from the OCI console. Now, once the config file is uh, done and ready, we go back to our code and we do the, the OCI uh, setup part. We import first our uh, OCI uh, uh, framework module. We uh, point here to the compartment OCID for the VM that is hosting the, the application. And then <clears throat> once we indicate the, the endpoint, for the generative AI service, Chicago one in our case, we create a generative AI client uh, that will be used later on to actually interact with, with the LLM, which is done here, by the way. So we're using a chat kind of uh, interaction uh, based on the cohere chat request model because we will use and let's see it here the cohere command r plus llm model we can we could use also llama if you want but this one is better for our for our use case uh, we indicate here sorry the prompt that we created before the no, no, maximum number of tokens to be included the temperature of the, of the LLM call, which means zero. So in, in our case, zero means the LLM will not be very creative, will respond each and every time in the same way. If you put 1.0 here, you will have a very creative answer and it will be different each time you, you uh invoke this uh, this this code and everything in between will be uh well balancing between the two extremes in our case we wanted to be able to to achieve consistency so we said okay no creativity just give us the answers for each of the use cases you will need to to test here and to balance and to do many iterations and see what's uh, what's uh, working uh, best. The same with the other um, uh, usual LLM parameters. Here we just gave them some uh, some uh, values that are working well for us. You will need to experiment again. And then uh, we're calling here the the LLM, the generative AI client. We get a response and we print the, the relevant part of the of the response and we get something like this so here is the call with our question again what is always free and we get a very nice response based on the our well text chunks the client questions and the llm putting it all uh, together so basically that's it right it's um, it's the core of a chatbot using rag uh, an rag approach uh, now let's see what's next because like i said this is the core you will need to well to use it so you need to put something on top of it in order to be to be useful so you will need to first to to create an api endpoint for this code right you you want this this um, sequence of code uh, to be accessible for for the ui layer right so you will need an api that based uh, well uh, with a question parameter will send that question to this code will get the response back and send it back to the API caller. That's the first thing. And then, of course, you will need a, 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 the UI, right? The, the piece of code that will put something on, on the client screen, like an HTML slash JavaScript um, uh, chat interface, and uh, the client will be able to interact 
with the with the chatbot through the API in this way, or like we are doing in uh, for for our existing chatbot, we're also using Slack, uh, and we're using the Slack API in order to allow our clients to well use our Slack public Slack channels uh, in order to to send request questions to the to the chat. There are many ways to do that, and in uh, it really depends on your existing infrastructure, your use case, your requirements. Uh, but with an API and then this code behind it, it should be easy to, to implement that. Um, so like I said, the API server, and then <clears throat> uh, probably you will need to, to include more data sources. Like, again, based on your situation, your requirements, and your uh, use case. But the next one is very important. And uh, here, well, you don't want usually a business chatbot to respond uh, to weird questions or controversial questions or to respond about something else than your data, right? or you don't want to compare uh, the question to ask, uh, I don't know, uh, your, uh, your chatbot to say bad things about your own products. So you need what's called guard railing. And essentially this is another LLM call. You send the, the response, the first response from the LLM with a very uh, wisely crafted um, uh, prompt again to the LLM saying something like this is the response please identify uh, things that are not relevant to our company or are, are controversial or are offensive in any way and if the LLM the second LLM call is saying okay this is offensive content or this is about something that's not in our scope then you will send to the client something like sorry we cannot respond to this question if everything is fine from the guard railing call you just send the, the original response to the client and everything is fine so this is very important for production chatbots that are not general purpose they, if they are focused on something, then the guard railing will ensure that the answers are, are about that something and not something else. Uh, also, you can build more sophisticated ways of uh, storing the data sources and retrieving them, especially if your business domain is complicated or if it's very large, because if it's very large or it's it requires some structure, then you will need to implement that structure on top or replacing the, the vector search. Uh, also, in some cases, you will want uh, to have a chat. Uh, I mean, keep the context of a client interaction. So if the client it ask, is asking, like in our example, what is always free and the LLM is uh, responding, then maybe the next interaction with the client will be the client asking, uh, tell me more about this. So in our example, we just send the chunks and the question to the, to the chatbot. So the chatbot will not remember past interaction. So if you want to, to implement this, to, to have a, a memory of the current conversation, you will need also to include the past questions and past responses in each of the subsequent uh, calls to the to the LLM. So it will retain the memory of the conversation. This is not demonstrated here, but uh, it's quite uh, easy to, to implement. And finally, the last point here, uh, you will need a feedback loop, right? Because you want to, to be able to understand, to assess, if your chatbot is responding in a useful way to your customers. 
So this could be a simple thumbs up, thumbs down interface uh, for for uh, next to each response for the well the users to, to to click and indicate if they are happy or not happy with with the response, or it could be something more complicated like. Uh, a way for a user to actually describe what's wrong or what's going well with uh, with each of the responses. So now let's see how it works in real life. So we start on the Live Lab web page and we click start and then run on Live Labs sandbox. Okay, consenting, submit reservation, and then we wait for it to be provisioned. Okay, let's take a look here and wait for it. Okay, so we have our workshop ready. So let's click on view login info. And here we have this link to the Jupyter Lab environment. Let's copy also the password and then let's have a look. Great. So now let's go with the database tabs. Let's click on terminal and let's copy and paste the code from our environment okay let's start a shell and then quickly go through all the steps Sorry. we wait a little bit And now we check that everything is set up as it should be, and it is. So, exit. And that's it. Now let's move to the Python part. Let's create a new notebook. And here we are. And let's copy and paste the code. We download the APQ file, we drag it in Jupyter Labs, and it's there. And then we start with our ingestion code. Okay. Here we are, the FAQ file is ingested. Now let's load the chunks into the vector database. We use the same user as in the explanatory part. And now we connect to the database. We're creating the FAQ data uh, table in the database. And now the sentence transformers. Okay, doing the vectorization, creating the embeddings. And now let's save them in the database. That's fine. And now let's confirm that everything is okay. And we see some sample chunks being returned from the database. Great. Now let's go to the vector retrieval and LLM part. Okay, and now let's print the results. And as we expected, here we have the re returned chance. 
And now to the LLM, we start with a prompt. And now to the call with to the generative AI service. Okay, so <clears throat> I already prepared the OCA config file, so we should be ready to run our connection code. Perfect. And now the final step, running the LLM code. And we wait a little bit for it to be processed. And here we are. This is the response of the LLM crafted based on our prompt with our data sources and the client's question. And well, that's it. So basically, um, that's it in a nutshell and going very fast. Uh, and uh, you are most uh, more than welcome to just go to this live lab and do the all the steps by yourself and then uh, explore more if you if you if you want. Uh, so um, Violeta, Tom, back to you. To wrap up the call, and I hope that you uh, uh, found found the the demo interesting. And uh, as Bogdan and Liana said, there is the possibility to try it yourself. There is the the workshop available on our Live Labs platform. You have the link here, on chat and on Q and A uh, under the uh, the question that Tom opened at the start. Please feel free to try it yourself and come back to us on Slack in case you need any help. We will actually showcase the the full uh, workshop in a session that will take part in uh, November time frame under the onboarding program. Uh, is the, the registration page is not yet available, but once it is, we will post it on our uh, free cloud coaching um, events page. So there you can find um, you you can find all the upcoming events and register based on uh, based on on your interest. Uh, regarding the the cloud coaching sessions, um, some of you might not know. So I would like to to mention it again. We host events on a weekly basis. They are all free, happening every Wednesday, same time as today. In the next three uh, weeks, we will talk about um, IoT and the power of microcontrollers. Um, so if you'd like to learn more about this, feel free to go to our page and register to the next event. Then there is um, a dedicated session or Oracle Code Assist and how you will learn how to build applications faster with AI. And uh, the the last event of the month is about OCI document understanding um, service, um, and uh, there will be a, a very interesting demo that um, one of our cloud specialists have uh, has built for for uh, for this um, uh, event. So all of them are on our events page. If you want to register for the onboarding program that we are currently running. Feel free to to go to the kickoff um, uh, tab, and then you you will see there all the um, the upcoming events. As Liana said, she will deliver a security uh, um, onboarding event um, pretty soon. So if you want to learn in a hands-on fashion style how to uh, create and deploy an application. Uh, using OCI functions, if I remember right, and Python, and right, uh, and uh, API Gateway, API Gateway, 
you you have the possibility to register to the kick of your Oracle Cloud Journey Part 3 event, which is currently available on the um, on our events page. And uh, if you want to test the chatbot that Bogdan and Liana um, uh, showcased today, it is available on the public Slack um, community workspace under the app site. So what you have to do is to, to find it there and then click chat um, uh, sh slash chatbot and put your question in and you will see that we'll provide uh, a straight uh, answer on the go. So feel free to test it and let us know any any feedback. Uh, this is a very interesting page that we would like to share with you and you have the, the link uh, on chat and on, on Q&A as well. I would say if you are uh, a developer interested in learning more about AI, this is the, the perfect place for you. You can find a lot of uh, AI solutions built by Oracle specialists and real world scenarios, demos, um, um, source code and uh, a lot of tutorial videos that you can use and learn, of course, about our AI solutions. Here is another slide with a lot of materials and documentation available to you. To, uh, so I would not take you through all of these links. A copy of the presentation that you saw today will be shared with you on uh, Slack. And if you'd like to get it via email, in case you cannot join us at Slack, of course, for um, for whatever reason, feel free to to email um, uh, at the contact dash tcx dash emia um, uh, mailbox, and myself or Tom will be more than happy to to share it with you. Let me check if there is. Uh, uh, if I could interrupt, um, there is yeah, uh, sure. just a. A few, I see a, a, quite a few people asking about the presentation. I know you just mentioned it, but just to be clear, you will get a, a PDF. We share it over in Slack as well. Uh, and you get a, a link to this recording um, by email. We post it on YouTube. All of these are on YouTube. Um, the second one, Bogdan, Liana, I do have a quick question. There was a chat right at the very start, Dave, who asked a question about um, the parameter vector memory size. Did you? It's a database. Um, parameter. Did you change that or anything, or did you just go with the default? Um, we just use the defaults, which are recommended by the 23 AI documentation uh, for the ah, uh, free cool. version of the database. So okay, within cool. the documentation for each of the database versions, you will see what are the recommended sizes to be used uh, within the actual developer's guide. Cool. Thanks. Thanks, Liana. All right. So I still see some questions here, but um, due to time constraints, I don't think we can cover them all uh, today, but we promise we follow up with you on Slack and uh, via email in case you, uh, you are not on Slack uh, yet. And uh, yeah, we will provide all, all the answers uh, pretty soon. With that, I would like to thank you all for joining us today. I hope you enjoyed the session. And in case you want to see it again uh, in a hands-on um, uh, workshop, as I said, keep uh, keep an eye on the schedule and register for uh, for the event in November. Many thanks for being here. Many thanks Bogdan and Liana for presenting. Many thanks to the entire team for helping with the Q &A. Uh, and I hope to see you soon. Bye bye. Happy coding. Thank you all. Bye. Bye. Happy coding.